job. I, I've done that myself. I didn't have to. Good morning, church. Stand with us. Let's begin worship today.
Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. Uh, you're in good voice. Welcome. Please have a seat. We want to welcome all those who are here with us in the Worship Center on May the 2nd, all of our friends, brothers and sisters worshiping at home on live stream. Uh, so glad to have all of you with us today. I love that song. I love the fact that it just affirms that His grace is enough for every one of my needs, right? My biggest need is salvation and forgiveness. And that's the greatest need that he's met, of course, through his atoning death on the cross on our behalf. I was walking through a Panera recently and noticed a neighbor of one of our senior adults, and I just said hi to this lady. She was there with three other ladies, introduced me. And this lady said that she missed our friend Diana Bush. And I said, I do too, but one of these days we're going to see Diana. And, I, and she said, well, how do you know for sure? And I said, because Diana knew Jesus, and I know Jesus, and one of these days we're going to see each other again. Amen? I started to walk away, and the Lord said, you're not done yet. Welcome back. And her name is Carol. I said, Carol, let me remind you, this is the best deal in town. This is the best deal in town. Forgiveness of sins, grace that is greater than our sin, and the promise of heaven, this is the greatest thing. Amen? So His grace is enough. It's over the top, more than we will ever, ever need. We want to invite you this morning to take spiritual steps in your heart, in your mind, toward the Lord's table, toward communion. So if you would find your cup and prepare for just a moment as we want to give you the, the cue. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight that before we drink the cup, before we eat the bread, that each person should examine his heart. The word in the text actually means something stronger than our English word examine. It means test. It means to rigorously examine. This is around the idea of confession. One of the problems in our culture, brothers and sisters, is nobody's responsible anymore for their sin. We know we're sinners. Amen. And so before we come to the bread and the cup this morning, we should examine our hearts and enter into a wonderful time of confession of sin. So I'm going to lead us in a prayer of confession. We've been praying for several months that Pastor Paul has been leading us in. We'll pray that prayer aloud, and then we'll pause for a few seconds of personal confession. You might say, well, Tim, what are you talking about? Well, whatever that thought or action was yesterday, whatever you've struggled with in your flesh already today, whatever it is that constantly hinders your joy, silently speak that sin, name it, speak it to the Lord, and ask Him to forgive you. Read this prayer with me, friends. Read it aloud. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Would you bow your heads? And just be silent before the Lord as you confess your sins. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us, we pray. In your holy name, amen. So would you peel off that first layer? Take the wafer, the bread at home. The Lord said, this is my body broken for you.
And now the cup, this powerful symbol of the blood that disinfects our hearts and scrubs us clean. We praise him for forgiveness through his blood. Jesus encouraged us to drink. And all the believers said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand as Paul leads us again to sing? were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in everything he might be preeminent. 
For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. skilled to understand what God has willed, what God has planned. I only know at His right hand stands one who is my Savior. I take Him at His word and died to save me this I believe. and in my heart I find a need of him to be my savior that he would leave his place on high and come for sinful men to die you count it strange, so once did I Before I knew my Savior My Savior loves, my Savior lives My Savior is always there for me My God, He was, my God, He is My God is always gonna be My Savior loves, my Savior lives My Savior is always there for me my God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always going to be. Yes, living, dying, let me live. My strength, my solace from this spring. That He who lives to be my King. Once died to be my Savior That He would leave His place on high And come for sinful man to die You count it strange, so once did I Before I knew my Savior my Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives. My Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be. My Savior loves, my Savior lives, my Savior is always there for me. My God, He was, my God, He is, my God is always gonna be.
the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the four living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Days in darkest night, needing a rescue, wondering how we would survive. The humble Christ came down, pushed back the darkness all around. Our sins were forgiven. Our souls and hearts, all of our minds in every part, all our devotion, all our commitment from the start, and all of our songs of praise, all of the worship we can raise, all of the glory. All of the honor, all our days, you tired souls Jesus sustains us through it all helping us walk on that beautiful blessed narrow road the grace of Christ now stands as our only sure foundation he's our only refuge our only hope and all of our souls and hearts, all of our minds in every part, all our devotion, all our commitment from the start, and all of our songs of praise, all of the worship we can all of the glory and all of the honor all our days you deserve speak face to face and we will sing of all of the wonders that we have seen and all of our souls and hearts all of our minds in every part all our devotion all our commitment from the start Glory and all of the honor, all our day. You 
tes Church in Exodus 34, starting in verse 6, God declares himself who he is. Israel is standing at the bottom of Mount Sinai, and this is what God actually says about himself. He doesn't transmit this through Moses. This is God speaking to Israel. And so uh, I want us to read this together. I want us to read the words of God together that he gave to Moses about himself. Read this with me. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Father, my prayer this morning is that we would take you seriously. God, that we would know that you hate sin and that sin has consequences. Help us to take that part of you seriously, but also help us to take seriously the fact that you are so willing and ready to forgive that through Jesus Christ, all of our sins are paid for. Help us to take that seriously, God. Help us to rest in the fact that you are merciful and gracious, slow to anger. God, bless our service today. We pray that you would speak to us through the message. We pray that our hearts would be drawn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, church. For this 
Good morning, church. Let me pray for us. Lord God, thank you for your mercy over us, your grace that is new. Thank you for the hope that you bring us. Lord, we pray that as we, we talk about the things of you this morning, that it would be good and true and meaningful and right I pray that you would speak into our hearts truth that we need today. In this room, we're coming from all kinds of walks of life. We've experienced all kinds of stuff this week. Some of it has been garbage. Some of it has been uh, joyful. And so, God, we come to you with all kinds of different experiences and needs that we need you to speak into and to do stuff with. And, God, we pray that you would do that. You're big enough, you're strong enough, you're powerful enough to do that for each one of us right where we are. And so, God, we beg you to do that this morning. We pray a blessing over our congregation that you would give us unity, that you would give us purpose, that you would give us grace. Be with us now, in Jesus' name, amen. Church, last month, after celebrating resurrection, uh, the resurrection at Easter, the rest of the month of April was all about hearing Pastor Mark, uh, his vision and direction for the church as he gets ready to take on the role of lead pastor. And we really just marinated for three weeks in the idea that from now on, our identity as members of Green Ridge Baptist Church is that we are exiles, exalting God and exerting good so our neighbors experience Jesus. This week, we're starting a new series called Seek His Face. And this is going to be a, a, a series on prayer that runs throughout the whole month of May. And really, this series is, is coinciding with the timeline that Pastor Mark laid out for us uh, over the last three weeks that leads us up to our grand reopening on the second Sunday of September. 
The next step in our timeline is a month of praying. Praying for the future of the church, praying for our communities, praying for God to help us understand what he wants us to do to help Green Ridge be a light to the world around us. The month of May is all about prayer for us. All month long, the pastors are going to talk about prayer, and all month long, we're actually going to call you to pray. Each Sunday this month, we're going to ask you all to pray for something very specific. For each week of May, we want the hearts of our church to be united around praying for something specific about the future of, of our body. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this week's, all right? So, if you've got a pen or a note-taking app or whatever you got, be, be sure to jot this down. This is the thing that we want you all, us, as a congregation, to be praying for for the next seven days, all right? If you can remember it, that's cool too. But here it is. For the next seven days, we're asking that you pray for our search process for a new youth pastor and a new children's ministry director. Two huge positions that we have to fill as a congregation as we move forward into this new vision. And um, the youth pastor search is, is moving right along, and I, I hope that within the next month or so, I've got more information to share with you. Um, the children's ministry director search is actually just starting. So both of those processes need prayer, and the pastors are asking you over the next seven days, pray for those, pray for those things. Pray that God would send us the people who will fill these roles perfectly for us, for the glory of God. Pray that all the people involved in the processes would have wisdom and discernment and unity about how to move forward. And pray that we would make decisions that are pleasing to God and a blessing to the church. All right, so that's your prayer task for this week. You'll get a new one next Sunday. For the message today, I was tasked with just introducing us to prayer. My goal was to answer the question, what is prayer? So we're starting real basic, right? Just the most fundamental starting place for any topic. What is it? And before we get too far, I'm going to be really honest with you about something, about my relationship with prayer. And what I'm about to tell you is something that some of you may actually be really disappointed about. Some of you may actually be a little bit offended by. And I don't mean to offend you, and I don't mean to disappoint you, but I do want to be honest with you about about something. Um, so just brace yourselves, okay? Here it is. I don't really like praying. And in fact, praying is one of those spiritual disciplines that I have really wrestled with for a long time. And part of the reason that I wrestle with it is because I have a, I have a really high view of how awesome and powerful and good God is. And I mean, like, I trust him to do what's best for the kingdom, and I trust him to do what's best for me. And there are times when I think, why do I need to pray? God can do whatever he wants. He doesn't need to listen to me. And I'm good with God doing whatever he wants. That's fine. I'm okay with that. And I'm not saying that I don't pray. What I am saying is that prayer is something that I really have to work at. And I tell you all of that for a couple of reasons. One of them is that I think it's really important, and this is like a side topic that we could talk more about later, but I think it's really important for all y'all to remember that pastors are just people. We're not spiritual rock stars, okay? We don't have all of this stuff figured out. Never, please, never put us on a pedestal. Jesus Christ is the only one who should ever be on a pedestal. Amen? We are human. We have struggles. We have failures. There are some things in our walks with Jesus that we struggle with that you guys don't have any problems with. And that's just the nature of being in the body of Christ. So don't elevate us above where we should be. The other reason I tell you that is because we're about to spend a whole month talking about prayer. 
And if prayer is something that you struggle with, if it's something that you find difficult or weird or whatever, I want you to know that I am right there with you. As one of your pastors, prayer is something that I really have to struggle with so I do it faithfully and consistently. It's something that I fight for in my walk with Jesus. And I do fight for it, but it's still something that I don't really like doing. So when I talk about what prayer is today, when I, when I, when I give you my thoughts on prayer and guidance on prayer, I'm not doing it from the place of a know-it-all. I'm doing it from the place of a person who's still struggling to love God well in this. And I'm doing it from the place of a person who has really wrestled with God about prayer. You know, when I really stop to think about prayer and why I've had such a hard time with it, I think the reason is because I never fully grasped what I was doing when I was praying. Like, why am I doing this? God knows my mind. He knows my heart. God knows me better than I know myself. What is it, what is it that I'm trying to accomplish here? And I've always known that I should pray, right? Jesus expects us to pray from Matthew chapter 6. You can see that. And like, Everyone in the Bible is praying. Even the really evil people are praying. So I've always known that I should be praying, but I've always struggled with this question of what is prayer? Like, what is it for? Why am I doing this? What is this thing that I'm trying to do? And I know that we could easily say, well, prayer is just talking to God. And I agree with that. But I need something more than that. My soul isn't satisfied with that. What is praying doing for me? What is praying doing for my relationship with God? Does God even want me talking to him? Why? And as I've thought through the idea of prayer, as I've read the Bible and talked with brothers and sisters in Christ and read books about prayer, I think I would boil the what of prayer down to this. Prayer is pursuit. Prayer is a running after something. When we pray, we set out on a journey for a very specific purpose. We have a very specific destination in mind when we set out to pray. When we pray, we engage in a pursuit. We're chasing something. And I think that biblical prayer is a pursuit of at least three big things. Prayer is a pursuit of God. Prayer is a pursuit of godliness. And prayer is a pursuit of grace. For the rest of our time, I want to unpack these things for us this morning. All right? Prayer is a pursuit of God. Prayer is a pursuit of godliness. And prayer is a pursuit of grace. So let's start with the first one. Prayer is a pursuit of God. So this is pretty much the most fundamental thing that you can say about prayer. Everything else that we could say about prayer flows from this idea that when you sit down to pray or when you're praying in your car or on your morning walk or over your ham sandwich at lunchtime, whenever you're praying, you are fundamentally at rock bottom setting out on a journey in pursuit of God. When you pray, you are chasing after God. When you pray, you're putting your heart, mind, and body in a position of seeking out someone who is greater than you are. And when we think about biblical prayer, when we think about everything that we know about our good God from what he has revealed to us about himself in the Bible, we know that Christian prayer, biblical prayer, really begins with an invitation from God to know him. Prayer begins with the understanding that God has invited us to pursue him. He wants us to chase after him and to know him. Well, how do we know that? Well, as I'm reading the Bible, I'm always seeing God either engaging in relationship with people or even explicitly inviting people into relationship with him. We can go back as far as Adam and Eve. God talked with Adam and Eve. 
God even became physically present somehow in the garden and walked with Adam and Eve. And I'm not even 100% sure what that means, but that's what Genesis tells me. He was there. He was with them. And we take Genesis 1 and 2 as giving us the picture of how God intended for creation to exist, then God being with us and us being with God must be the way that God wants us to live. God wants us to be with him. God wants us to pursue him and to be in relationship with him. And we don't have to stop at Genesis 2. We can move through all of the people who had intimate, active prayer lives with God. Like, just start naming people. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Joshua, Deborah, Hannah, Samuel, David, Solomon, Ezra, and so many other people. All of these people display for us a life that is filled with pursuing God through prayer. And when we read about these folks praying, God is pleased with them when they pray. Often in the Old Testament, the act of crying out to God with your words and with your emotions is depicted as one of the most holy things that a person can do. Prophet after prophet calls on the people of God to cry out to God in repentance and praise. The people of God are constantly called to pursue God through prayer. And then we come to the New Testament where the call to pray just never stops. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus assumes that we as God's people will be praying. Jesus himself lives this out. So many times throughout his ministry, he would go off by himself so that he could pursue God alone in prayer. In Acts 2, we hear that the disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The apostle Paul says over and over again, pray, pray, pray. In Romans 12, 12, he says, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Pray without ceasing, he says in 1 Thessalonians 5. And the fundamental idea underlying all of these calls to prayer and all of these examples of prayer is the idea that God is our God. And he has made us in a way that we can commune with him. We can be with him and interact with him. Because of this, his desire is that we would pursue him. Prayer is that act of pursuing God where we are actively engaged in building our relationship with Him. Maybe one of the passages that captures this idea uh, best comes from Jeremiah 29. God speaks through Jeremiah and He says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Now, of course, we shouldn't take this out of context, right? We know that this passage was written specifically to the Jews who were in exile in Babylon. This promise that God would restore their fortunes and bring them back to their land, that's a promise for those people. At that time, those are not promises for us. But what I think does apply to us in this passage is that God has consistently told his people that when we seek him, we will find him. When the people of God pursue God, God lets them catch Him. He wants to be pursued by us. He wants to be found by us. He wants to be known and loved by you through your prayer. A huge part of pursuing God is engaging in this act of prayer. Prayer is a pursuit of God. 
Prayer is also a pursuit of godliness. For those of you who took my class on spiritual disciplines, a lot of this is going to be a review for you. But church, prayer is one of those tools that God has given us to shape our souls to look more like Jesus. 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul says, Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. In these verses, the Apostle Paul not only tells us that training for godliness is one of the best things we can do for ourselves, he's also implicitly telling us that there's actually training for godliness. There's actually stuff that we can do to prepare ourselves to be godly. Being like Christ isn't something that we just wake up to one day. It's it's not just something that just happens. You have to train for godliness. Over in 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul gives us a a little snapshot of his uh, training for godliness. He says, I discipline my body and keep it under control. I think I originally learned this verse in the NIV, and it says, I beat my body into submission, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Godliness requires training. Training requires discipline. And friends, this is where all of the spiritual disciplines come into play. All the stuff you've heard about. Bible reading, prayer, fasting, silence, tithing, all kinds of stuff. This is where those disciplines come into play. The spiritual disciplines are the tools that God has given us to say no to our sin-driven habits and to say yes to godliness. And as I like to do, I've, I've defined the idea of spiritual discipline so it's easier for me to think about it. I have to define stuff. And the definition that I, I've given spiritual disciplines is kind of long, uh, but it's, it's got a lot of parts, but it's good. I, I think it's a definition that can be really helpful when we think about the disciplines. So the spiritual disciplines are this. They are biblical practices that train our hearts, minds, and bodies to seek, savor, and submit to God. The disciplines are things that we do, that we learn about from the Bible, that take all of the parts of us that have been touched by sins, our our emotions, our intellects, even our physicalness, and the disciplines gather up our whole selves and they train us to pursue God and love God and obey God. So what does this have to do with prayer? Prayer. Well, it's pretty clear to me from reading the Bible that prayer is one of the core disciplines of the Christian life. The people of God are expected to be a praying people. Like I said in the first point, prayer is first and foremost a running after God that He has invited us to. God wants us to be with Him and talk with Him and pursue Him. So prayer is one of the core spiritual disciplines. And as a core spiritual discipline, prayer is one of the primary tools that God wants us to use to train ourselves to seek Him and savor Him and submit to Him. And at this point, we can ask how? How does prayer train us for godliness? What is it about the act of prayer that takes our hearts, minds, and bodies and teaches them to run after God instead of running after sin? And the answer to this isn't really that hard to come up with when you think about what you're actually doing when you're praying. When you pray, you are automatically humbling yourself before a being who is greater than you are. The act of prayer has humility built into it. It also comes with the recognition, at least at some level, that God is with you, that He hears you, and that He cares. When you pray, you have the opportunity to do all kinds of things that put your heart, mind, and body in a posture of submission and worship. You can spend time in your prayer praising God and thanking Him. You can spend time telling God how good He is. 
You can even spend time just listening for God to move in your heart and mind. Even that's an act of submission and worship. Your physical posture when you pray when you pray can be an act of submission, bowing or standing with your hands raised while you pray. Church, when we force ourselves to stop, put everything else down, turn off all the devices, to be alone, when we force ourselves to stop and engage God in this kind of prayer, we are training ourselves for godliness. This constant, regular, daily habit of submission to God in prayer gets us ready to submit to God throughout the rest of our day. A habit of prayer prepares us to run after God when the rest of life is telling us to run after sin. When we make this kind of prayer a regular habit, a daily habit, we are training our hearts, minds, and bodies to seek, savor, and submit to God. Prayer is a pursuit of godliness. Finally, this morning, prayer is a pursuit of grace. And like I've said before, grace is one of those really, really good church words, but we need to be careful that we define it because sometimes we use it so often we don't really know what it means. Grace is the good thing that you get that you don't deserve. It's grace. James, the Lord's brother, in his, in his little letter in the Bible, says every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. We experience God's grace every minute of every day. These breaths that we're breathing, these neurons that are firing, the provisions that we enjoy, the beautiful weather, whatever it is, not to mention <laughs> the salvation that we have in Christ. All of this is God's grace. But prayer is one of those things that God has given us to actually ask for more grace. Can you believe that? God already gives us grace upon grace, and yet He's given us a way to ask for more from Him. An easy place to see this is from the Lord's Prayer that we've been praying over the last couple months. Look at it again and look at everything that Jesus told us to ask for. Look at all of the grace in this prayer. He says, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He says, Make your name holy. Make it holy in my life. Help me to honor your name as holy. That's asking God for grace. Your kingdom come. God's kingdom of peace and justice and wholeness and goodness. God, bring that here. We want it, please. That's asking God for grace. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, make what you want happen here just like you do in heaven. Align people's hearts and minds with what you want. That's asking for God's grace. Give us this day our daily bread. Grace. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Grace. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Grace and grace. Jesus Christ himself has demonstrated for us that prayer is a pursuit of grace. It's a running after grace from God. When we pray, we are running after and seeking out God's blessing and protection and provision. And this is good. It's right for us to do this. God wants us to do this. And this doesn't mean that prayer is some blank check that God hands you to just write down whatever you want on it and God will give it to you. It's not how prayer works. Remember, prayer is also a pursuit of godliness. While we are asking for God's grace, God is also shaping our desires around what He wants. 
Again, James writes, you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Prayer is not ask for whatever you want. Prayer is a tool that God has given us to ask for more of His grace in our lives. So church, prayer is pursuit. It's a pursuit of God, it's a pursuit of godliness, and it's a pursuit of grace. And I think this is a pretty good place for us to start when we're thinking about what prayer is. But now, we do need to ask ourselves, what do I really think about prayer? Examine that in your head and your heart. What do you really think about prayer? How do you approach prayer? What do you actually think you're doing when you pray? Ask yourself those things. Especially if you struggle with praying. Church, prayer is a gift. Do you think about it as a pursuit of God? Do you treat prayer as a response to God's invitation to you? God's invitation is open to you to come and to just be with Him. To talk with Him and know Him and hear from Him through prayer. Take hold of that opportunity. Don't let your day go by without enjoying the privilege of talking with the God who made you and who loves you. What about godliness? Do you really understand that a habit of prayer is one of the things that God uses to shape your soul to look like Christ? Do you use prayer for that consciously? Some of us have a lot of work to do to form a habit of prayer. Some of us just don't have a habit of prayer. We throw up a prayer every now and again. Maybe we think about it in the car and we'll, we'll throw up a prayer at lunchtime. But this habit of prayer where we meet with God intentionally to be with Him. Some of us have some work to do to make that a habit in our lives. I'm one of them. I'm still in the process of changing how my day looks so that prayer becomes a habit in my life with a purpose. Do you have the same thing? Do you need to start developing that habit of prayer? Pursue godliness through prayer. And finally, don't forget that God has given us prayer so that we can pursue His blessing, His grace. Friend, are you in crisis? Are you in need? Do you have family or friends or a situation that you wish God would just bless? Have you prayed about those things? Have you taken them before God and asked Him to move in those things? If those are the things that are on your heart, then pray for God's blessing. Pray for His grace. Don't miss out on the opportunity to seek God's face and ask for Him to give you good things. Church, prayer is a pursuit of God. It's a pursuit of godliness. And it's a pursuit of grace. Let me pray for us. God, thank you for what the Bible teaches us about prayer. Thank you that you have given us clear instruction and understanding about what prayer is. And even now, as I engage in the act of prayer, God, I ask for your grace on us. That we would pursue you more through prayer. That we would pursue godliness more through prayer. And that we would pursue your grace. Thank you for this gift. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So good. So helpful and practical. Uh, Paul, thank you for opening the word to us. Remember that we're starting this month-long journey as a congregation for prayer. And Paul has lifted up for us that the first prayer concern for the week is that we will pray for our youth pastor search process and the process for our next children's ministry director. So please be faithful. Carve out that time morning, lunchtime, evening, carve out that time and pray for those requests. A couple of announcements, and then I'll uh, read a blessing over us. Remember that uh, we're registering for worship on Sunday, the previous Tuesday. So this Tuesday, the 4th, you can register. 
Next Sunday is Mother's Day. So if you're planning to bring some extra folks, that's great. Please get online on Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and re reserve your spot. Thank you for your generous support for the love offering for Cuba. We received more than we needed, actually. And uh, this brother that I met several years ago will now have a, an electric utility vehicle that he can use in all of those villages uh, east of Havana as he shares the gospel and takes food and other things, Bibles, to house churches. Um, two weeks from today, we'll have a business meeting at 11.30 via Zoom uh, to hear the latest financial report and some recommendations from Arthur Cups, our stewardship leader, about some surplus funds God has provided. So that'll be at 11.30 on the 16th. All right, would you stand, please? And as we have been doing, uh, open your hands if you would, uh, palms up. You might want to close your eyes if it helps you concentrate and listen. Uh, receive this word from Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness or your patience be known to everybody. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that good news? Amen. Have a blessed day. Pray, pray, pray. Enjoy your day.